The Medal of Honor is our nation's highest military award, reserved for those who demonstrate conspicuous gallantry above and beyond the call of duty. Now, in the history of the Medal of Honor, only six naval aviators have received the award for carrier-based operations. The first recipient was Butch O'Hare. Butch O'Hare was raised in St. Louis, Missouri. His parents divorced in 1927, and his father went to Chicago, where he was an associate of the mobster Al Capone. Now, as a function of Butch trying to get into the Naval Academy, his father attempted to distance himself from Al Capone by providing the government evidence of the mobster's tax evasion. This would come back to haunt him some years later. So Butch graduated from the Academy as a member of the class of 1937. As was the convention back then, he served for two years as a surface warfare officer and then went to flight school. Now, while he was a flight student in Pensacola, Butch got word that his father had been gunned down and killed by Capone's men, certainly as retribution for that evidence that he turned over about tax evasion. So obviously not a good situation for the O'Hare family at that time. So Butch got his wings, wound up in VF-3 aboard Saratoga. Less than a month after Pearl Harbor, Butch was having a meal in the wardroom of Saratoga in the Pacific when a Japanese torpedo hit the carrier. So Saratoga doesn't sink, but she's sidelined. So VF-3 is cross-decked to the USS Lexington and sent immediately into harm's way. So their mission is to engage the Japanese fleet coming out of Rabaul Harbor. And when Lexington is located about 400 miles from Rabaul, they're discovered by a Japanese patrol plane. So VF-3 launches, led by the skipper of the squadron, Lieutenant Commander John Thatch, and he shoots down the patrol plane, but not before they get word back to the Japanese of the presence of Lexington. So that same day, later in the afternoon, Lexington picks up radar contacts, and they launch six Wildcats, again led by Lieutenant Commander Thatch. As that six plane is headed for the radar contacts, they get radar contacts on another group of Japanese bombers coming in, and so they send the other two Wildcats to engage this second group that they've just picked up. Now, that two-plane is led by Lieutenant Butch O'Hare, and by the time they get to this group of bombers, they're only nine miles away from Lexington. Now, during this first run against this V formation of Betty's, a Japanese bomber, Butch's wingman discovers that his gun is jammed, so he pitches off and heads back for the ship. So Butch is by himself. He, he proceeds to do what's called a deflection run, a slashing attack, against the far ends of the V, starting with the starboard side. Immediately goes after the rightmost trailer, aiming for the engine mount, takes it out right away, and then slashes through back to a high perch and takes out the leftmost bomber and works his way through this formation in a similar fashion, one by one. Now, meanwhile, Thatch's foreplane is done with that first group. They shot down four of them, damaged a couple others, and the ship took out the remainder. So he's on his way over to help out Butch. And when he gets sight, he sees three Japanese bombers in flames. So Commander Thatch's timing is perfect in that Butch is what we call Winchester, meaning he's out of bullets. The Wildcat only had 450 rounds to start with. And so after his fifth run, Butch is completely out of ammo. So if you do the math, he's only used about 60 plus bullets per kill, which is a tribute to his air-to-air -air gunnery technique. So Thatch's foreplane takes out most of what Butch was unable to shoot down himself, and then the ship dodges the bombs dropped from the others, so Lexington is safe. So they land back aboard the ship. Everybody made it back except one of the fighters that did not do a deflection attack, just was saddled in behind the bombers and got shot down by the tail gunner. So as the dust settles and they're doing the after-action reports, the skipper of Lexington realized that Butch O'Hare probably saved the ship. And as a result of that, he recommends Butch for the Medal of Honor. So on the day he receives the award from Franklin Delano Roosevelt, he also is promoted to lieutenant commander. Part of his citation reads as follows. Despite this concentration of opposition, Lieutenant O'Hare, by his gallant and courageous action, his extremely skillful marksmanship in making the most of every shot of his limited amount of ammunition, shot down five enemy bombers and severely damaged a sixth before they reached the bomb release point. As a result of his gallant action, 
one of the most daring, if not the most daring, single action in the history of combat aviation, he undoubtedly saved his carrier from serious damage. Butch was sent on a tour around the country to try to raise money for war bonds and to improve the spirits of American citizens. He didn't get back to the fight until late 1943, where he was assigned as the air wing commander. Unfortunately, he was killed while trying to do a new warfare tactic, which was a nighttime intercept. And during one of those nighttime missions, Butch was hit either by a stray round from a Japanese gunner, or he may have been shot down by his wingman, what we call a blue on blue. In either case, O'Hare was lost. As an enduring tribute to this great naval aviator, the Chicago airport was named for him, O'Hare Airport. And if you walk through the airport, you may come across a replica of his Wildcat. A few months after Butch O'Hare's actions that earned him the Medal of Honor, it was a couple of bomber pilots turned for conspicuous gallantry. The first one was a shipmate of O'Hare's aboard Lexington, a bomber pilot named William Hall, who was in Scouting Squadron 2. So this is the Battle of Coral Sea on the 7th and 8th of May, 1942. So on the 7th of May, Lieutenant J.G. Hall was part of an attack against a Japanese aircraft carrier that assisted in the destruction of that vessel. And then on the 8th of May, as stated in his Medal of Honor citation, facing heavy and fierce fighter opposition, he again displayed extraordinary skill as an airman and the aggressive spirit of a fighter in repeated and effectively executing counterattacks against a superior number of enemy planes in which three enemy aircraft were destroyed. And although he was seriously wounded, he managed to land his airplane back aboard Lexington. At the same time, Lieutenant John James Powers was flying Dauntless aboard Yorktown as part of Bombing Squadron 5. So as the Battle of Coral Sea developed on the 7th of May, Powers and his companions discovered the carrier Shoho and bombing at extremely low altitudes sank her in 10 minutes. So the next morning, while the Battle of Coral Sea intensified, he joined the attack against the carrier Shokaku and scored an important bomb hit. According to his Medal of Honor citation, without fear or concern for his own safety, he courageously pressed home his attack and almost to the very deck of an enemy carrier did not release his bomb until he was sure of a direct hit. During the Medal of Honor ceremony, which was awarded to Powers posthumously, President Roosevelt quoted something that Powers had told his fellow pilots before they manned up. He said, remember, the folks back home are counting on us. I'm going to get a direct hit if I have to lay it on the flight deck. And that's basically what John James Powers did. The fourth Navy pilot who received the Medal of Honor for going above and beyond the call of duty while operating from an aircraft carrier is David McCampbell. McCampbell's Navy career started kind of dubiously. He graduated with the Naval Academy class in 1933, but because it was the Depression and defense budgets were down, he wasn't commissioned. He was sent home as a civilian. A year later, he was commissioned as an ensign in the U.S. Naval Reserve and ordered to serve as a surface warfare officer aboard the USS Portland. He was a member of the Portland crew for about three years, and then he went to flight school. He didn't pin on his Navy wings until April 21st, 1938, so that's about five years after he graduated from the Naval Academy. His first tour is with VF-4 aboard Ranger. He goes from VF-4 to an LSO tour, landing signal officer aboard WASP. He is aboard WASP in 1942 when that carrier is sunk by a torpedo from a Japanese submarine. He returns to the States, promoted to lieutenant commander, and then in February of 1944, he is assigned to the USS Essex as the carrier air wing commander for CAG-15 the fabled 15 as they become known. So on June 19th, 1944, during the Marianas Turkey shoot, a subject we've tackled on the channel before with the purest, most badass carrier aviation movie ever episode, Commander McCampbell shoots down five Japanese Judy dive bombers to become an ace in a day. And then for good measure during a second sortie later in the day, he shoots down two Zeeks over Guam. Then on October 24th, 1944, during the initial phase of the Battle of Leyte Gulf, he becomes the only American airman to achieve ace-in-a-day status a second time. He leads a two-plane against a Japanese force of 60 aircraft. McCampbell shoots down nine, seven zeros and two Oscars, setting a U.S. single-mission aerial combat record. His, his wingman shot down another six Japanese airplanes. When he trapped aboard Langley because the flight deck of Essex was fouled, his six machine guns had just two rounds remaining, and his airplane had to be towed out of the wires because he was completely out of fuel. 
As a result of all of these actions, Commander McCampbell was awarded the Medal of Honor. Thomas Hudner grew up in Massachusetts. His family owned a chain of grocery stores. He attended the Naval Academy and graduated with the class of 1947, got his wings, and was assigned to a Corsair squadron stationed aboard the USS Leyte VF-32, which happened to be my first squadron as well. In the fall of 1950, the Korean War was just getting started. General MacArthur had just met with President Truman on Wake Island. It was their only face-to-face -face meeting until MacArthur was later fired by Truman. But at this meeting on Wake Island, MacArthur assured Truman that the Chinese would not be entering the war. A few weeks later, 300,000 Chinese troops flowed from China into North Korea and set the scene for what was the Chosen Reservoir Campaign, where the U.S. Marines had to fight their way out of there in a bitter cold. VF-32 was aboard Leyte, providing close air support for those Marines during the Chosen Reservoir Campaign. On December 4th, 1950, six Corsairs launched on what was called a Roadrunner mission, which is basically close air support for the Marines. Included in that sixth plane was Thomas Hudner and his best friend in the squadron, Ensign Jesse Brown. At some point during this mission, Brown was hit at first he didn't notice, one of his wingmen saw fuel streaming out of his airplane and he radioed him and told him so. And soon afterwards, he radioed that he was losing power and that his engine was seizing up. One of the other members of the flight spotted a clearing and advised Brown to attempt a belly landing there, which he did. So it's the Denner winter, and as he hits, it causes this cloud of snow and crumples his Corsair. So the other five airplanes are transmitting among themselves. They assume he died on impact, but Thomas Hudner does not want to believe that, so he does a low pass. And as he does, he sees Jesse Brown waving to him. So Hudner says to the other, he's alive. I'm not going to leave him there so that the Chinese can capture him. So Hudner performs an amazing act. He force lands his airplane gear up in the snow near where Brown crashed. Gets out of the airplane, runs through the snow over to where Brown is, and discovers that he's actually trapped in the cockpit the way that the nose folded up, pinned his legs. Hudner runs back to his airplane, which still has power, radios that he's still alive, asks the search and rescue helicopter to expedite coming to get him, and then runs back to Jesse's airplane and tries desperately to get him out of the wreckage. He has no luck. The helicopter shows up, lands, and Hudner and the helicopter pilot use an axe. After a while, it's getting close to nightfall. They have to leave. Hudner wraps his scarf around Jesse in a vain attempt to keep him warm and tells him, we'll be back tomorrow, pretty much knowing that there's no way he's going to be able to survive the night. Jesse Brown's last words to Thomas Hudner are, tell Daisy, his wife, I love her. The next day, Hudner beseeched the helicopter squadron to go back to recover his remains, but they said they couldn't. It was too dangerous. They wound up napalming the crash site, in order that the Chinese would not capture his remains. For his actions, Thomas Hudner was awarded the Medal of Honor. Both Brown and Hudner eventually had Navy ships named in their honor. The Brown, a Knox-class frigate, and the Hudner, a Burke-class destroyer. Thomas Hudner was able to carry out Jesse Brown's final wish to tell her that he loved her a couple of times at least, First at the event at the White House, where he received the Medal of Honor from President Truman, and later at the commissioning ceremony for the USS Jesse Brown. Hudner passed away in 2017 at the age of 93. The surface-to-air missile threat during the Vietnam War was intense, and the Iron Hand mission was created to try to mitigate it. Iron Hand was a gutsy mission. These pilots would fly directly into SAM envelopes with the hopes of distracting them as strike packages went through. They were armed with the AGM-45 Shrike missile, an early generation anti-radiation missile designed to take out SAM sites. Lieutenant Commander Mike Estosen was the operations officer for VA-192 aboard Ticonderoga. And on April 20th, 1967, he was flying an Iron Hand mission in support of a strike package. He flew right into the belly of the beast and wound up taking out three SA-2 sites, which allowed the strike package to successfully complete their mission. But he was hit by any aircraft fire at some point during the mission and managed to get back over the water and plug into an A-3 tanker. The A-3 escorted him back to Ticonderoga, basically pumping more gas than he was losing, but not by much. He unplugged the tanker at two miles, had enough gas for one look at the deck. As he crossed the ramp, his A-4 was on fire he got out safely and the crash crew doused the flames. 
And so six days later, Lieutenant Commander Ostosin is Sam hunting again. And this time he's pissed off because they've just lost a squadron mate. Lieutenant J.G. J.W. Kane was shot down by anti-aircraft fire. So Ostosin is out for blood. He's doing an Iron Hand mission in support of an Alpha Strike that's attacking a fuel dump near Haiphong Harbor. He delivers one strike, takes out a SAM. As he's climbing up for another attack on a different SAM site, he sees an SA-2 coming up towards him. Explodes near him, his airplane's on fire, but he converts his remaining energy into one last attack profile, delivers his last strike for a direct hit on the remaining SAM site. With his airplane on fire and drastically leaking fuel, he heads back to the ship. One of the airwing fighters, an F-8 Crusader flown by Lieutenant Commander John Nichols, joins on him and tries communicating with him, but he's unresponsive. And Nichols says that his head was slumped forward and there was significant damage to the left front of the airplane just below the canopy. Just shy of the shoreline, Stosin's airplane rolls inverted and winds up crashing to the ground. Nichols did not see an ejection, although reports later said that he did eject and there was a belief that he was captured by the North Vietnamese. Although the Estosian family held out hope for years, ultimately, Mike never returned. For his actions both on April 20th and April 26th of 1967, Estosian was awarded the Medal of Honor. In commenting on the mission later on, the F-8 pilot who joined on him, Lieutenant Commander Mike Nichols, said the following, Mike's aggressiveness and airmanship were unquestioned. He got the job done and he wanted more. We had kept the SAMs down while the strike went in and made a safe getaway. As soon as the bombers cleared the beach, our job was done, but Mike wasn't satisfied. That was the inherent risk of playing the electronic game of tag over North Vietnam. The desire to win could overshadow one's sense of preservation, and it cost us one of our best men. So there you have it. Six examples of conspicuous gallantry above and beyond the call of duty. Navy pilots who earned the Medal of Honor while operating from aircraft carriers in harm's way. All right, that'll do it for this episode. If you're a first-time viewer, please ring the bell and become a subscriber so you don't miss anything. Give me the likes, comment, and if you'd like to help support this channel, please consider using the super thanks function in the comments or become a patron at patreon.com slash wardcarol. And check the links below for coffee mugs and t-shirts and where to pre-order the Punks Trilogy that's being reissued by the Naval Institute Press in a few weeks. And in the meantime, I look forward to talking to you again soon.